In the summer of 1099, the armies of the First Crusade sacked Jerusalem and soon afterwards saw off the Egyptian forces at the Battle of Ascalon. Shortly after that, the bulk of the Crusaders went home to Europe. Exhausted, exultant, many of them pretty ill as well, they wanted to get home, leaving just a couple of hundred knights in the Holy Land to maintain and then build a Christian presence in the Near East. What a challenge these people faced. They are a diverse group themselves. The Crusaders were from all over different parts of Europe. So they themselves are competing with one another in some sense. But the peoples of the lands that they've taken over are even more diverse. You've got Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims, splinter groups of Shia Muslims, Eastern Christians, you've got Maronites, Nestorians, Jacobites, Armenians, Greek Orthodox, there's Jews, there's Zoroastrians. What an incredibly complicated mix. And that's one of the things that fascinates me is how on earth did this small, diverse group of Western Europeans survive, let alone impose their authority and create a series of institutions that lasted almost 200 years. Well, manpower is the first problem. They're desperately short of, of men. And so they send appeals to Western Europe pleading for people to come and support them. Strategically, the first thing they've got to do is, is capture the coastline. And so while they have Jerusalem, they need to mop up, if you like, the ports to give themselves an access route to Western Europe. So that's the first thing they do is capture the coastal cities in the first decade of the 12th century. They're able to do this for a couple of reasons. First of all, the Muslims are very, very split. You have the basic Sunni Shia division, basic part of, of, of Islam, I suppose, or the Muslim world, and that helps them. But there've been a number of political fragmentations in the 1090s. The First Crusade turns up at just the right moment. 10 years earlier, we'd have faced a very, very strong Seljuk Turkish Sultan. But there's a lot of disruption, and by the time you get to 1099, 1100, it's very fragmented city-states, and that really does help the Crusaders succeed. There's also very little sense of jihad. The Muslim counter-crusade is not really very strong as an idea at that time. But also in terms of capturing the coastal cities, it engages the attention and the interest and the support of the Italian trading cities, Pisa, Genoa, and Venice. And these three cities and the shipping skills that they bring are absolutely crucial in the formation and the survival of the Crusader states. They help, they have the, the skill to capture ports by, by using their ships as part of the military campaigns there, but they provide the arterial routes back to Western Europe. You can't keep marching through Europe and across a, fighting your way across Asia Minor every time you want to get to the Holy Land. It's just not practical. So you sail. And the only people with ships, good enough ships, are Pisa, Genoa and Venice, maybe a couple of other places. So that's the way to get more crusaders to the Holy Land. It's also the way to get pilgrims to the Holy Land. It's also then a way to get trade going. And so the traders, the Italian city-states, want to trade in goods that come from the Muslim Near East, bring them back to Europe and vice versa. So it has their interest and, and engagement. But when I say pilgrims as well, they are, I suppose, probably the most important part of, of, of this early crusading story. The First Crusade was launched to recover the Christian holy places, to enable pilgrims to fulfil their spiritual needs. And after the conquest of Jerusalem, tens of thousands of Europeans want to do that. So they will come to the Holy Land on, this, on these ships, and in a sense, holding on to the Holy Land demonstrates, if you like, the raison d'etre of the Crusader states, of the whole crusading movement. And when these people come to, to uh, the holy places, they're religious tourists. And like all tourists, they will need transport, they need food, they need lodging, they need looking after, they buy souvenirs, they want to go and see special places that have been developed for them. And in that modern sense, all those things are transposed onto the Crusader states. So for example, the Holy Sepulchre, the building that houses Christ's tomb. I think when the First Crusade turned up, there's a, a rotunda, a, a Byzantine building around it. A lot of the rest of the buildings are, are frankly a bit scrappy. There's much finer churches in Western Europe. So to allow the pilgrims 
religious tourists. They develop the Holy Sepulchre, a great big church that allows pilgrims to move around one building is constructed by, incidentally, by Queen Melisande of Jerusalem uh, early in the, in the 12th century. Pilgrims also need looking after, so you will get trade and income from this. They also need protection and health care. From those two things spring two of the great institutions of the Crusader States, the Knights Templar and the Knights Hospitaller, the military orders. The concept of the fighting warrior monk is developed. And that is an important part in the story of the Crusader States and does spring from pilgrimage. The Knights Hospitaller, the giveaways in the name. There's a hospital in Jerusalem, it's developed further. When people go abroad, they often get ill and they need to be looked after. And this hospital with far more sophisticated healthcare than Western Europe is, is part of that. Pilgrims also need protection. They want to go out towards the River Jordan, particularly where they're vulnerable to Muslim raiders and to bandits and apparently lions as well. And so the Templars are developed to protect them, to, if you like, escort them around the place. And when people help you, and when people help you when you're ill, you're grateful. So you give them money and you give them uh, land and privileges back in Europe. So when we think of the military orders, we think of big castles perhaps in the Holy Land, but they hold huge areas in Western Europe that have been given to them that generate the money that allow the Crusader states to survive. So it's from, from pilgrimage you get these, these institutions emerging and the money that they're given is, is a crucial part of their development and survival, as I say. So the establishment of the Crusader states is a complex, multifaceted issue. I would focus, first of all, on the lack of manpower, then the consolidation of the coastline, exploiting the divisions in the Muslim Near East, the importance of the Italians in providing economics and trade and arterial routes to bring pilgrims, who really in some senses are the lifeblood of the Holy Land. And they prompt the development of religious sites and they prompt the creation of the military orders.